just hit him with a Burke. Eh, let's go try. We don't get out of bed for anything less than a try nowadays, right? So, fuck it. Um... Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hey. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Hello, everybody. You know what it is. Hey. Um, first hey, things how's first, I hey. want to say hey, hi, and hello to everyone out there on the Twitch world. Welcome to our first workshop. It's under the umbrella of what we call Work From Home, which is a community and it is a framework for anything that involves panels, workshops, um, education, career, mentorships, all of that good stuff, you'll find it under Genji's Work From Home. And we're so excited to, to do our first workshop and it's going to be involving our GM, Balance Coach, and Pro Player, Maddie. So first things first, let's start with intros. Um, I am Christina. My friends call me Christina. Um, I am the director of Brand for Gen G and a little bit about myself. Um, I've been working here for about a year now and I am slightly a noob at gaming, but nevertheless, like basically a professional. Um, and my favorite video game would probably have to be Overcooked. I'm very legendary at that. And a fun fact is that that's my fun fact that I'm a legendary, I am goaded in Overcooked. <laughs> so I know. <laughs> You're welcome, everybody. Um, we'll start off with Nate. Take it away. Give us give a little intro. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Nate Stans, general manager of Genji's Western teams, which over this last year has included Valorant, CSGO, NBA 2K, and Fortnite. I've been with Genji three years, which is kind of since our inception, since we were KSV Esports. Uh, and I've worked with everyone in this call for a long time. So I'm excited to work with them to answer your questions. Give us your uh, favorite video game and a fun fact, if possible, sir. Oh, my favorite video game. I think that's hard because I go through phases. Right now, I'm only playing Valorant and Bloons Tower Defense 6. <laughs> so if you have any questions about either of those, I'm happy to help. 
I love that. And do you by chance have a fun fact or is that your fun fact? Uh, that could be a fun fact. The fun fact I usually use is I once crashed uh, from the sky in a hot air balloon. I, that doesn't sound very fun. Yeah, Wait, in real life? life? It's kind of, yeah, in real life, that's crazy, right? No one's ever done that. I've never met another person who has shared that experience with me. Can you give us like a 12 second like overview of what happened? Just 12 seconds. Yeah, it was a really, so I'm from uh, Yuma, Arizona, which is a little bit of a backwater town. And every year they have the Colorado River Crossing Balloon Festival. This is all real. I'm not making it up on the spot. Okay. And I was like eight years old and my dad was like the manager of a hotel. And one of the people who owned the hotel had a hot air balloon. So like, hey, we'll take your son up in the hot air balloon. It'll be fun. It's not windy. We go up, the wind starts blowing. They say, well, we got to land. It's going to be a hard landing. And we slam right into a lettuce field. A lettuce field? <laughs> a lettuce field. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You really just like made a chopped salad there. And I'm yeah. looking for that. I love that for you. Well, uh, welcome. Next week we'll have to get Cutie day. on here because she's got some fun facts as well that I learned on my <laughs> stream. So uh, it'll be fun. We got to do it. We got to do it. Well, I don't know how you're really going to top that, um, Andrew, but you can you can try your best. Yeah, I'm probably not going to top it. but. Um, my name is Andrew Leverett. I am the uh, Gingy Valorant coach. Uh, I've been with Gingy for uh, a little over a year now. Um, I've worked in a couple of different positions. Um, I, I worked with uh, an Apex Legends team we had. I worked with uh, Maddie and our Fortnite team for a while. And now I am working um, purely on Valorant. Um, what else? What else? We... A favorite video game and or a fun fact, but also just like to let everyone know, like Andrew's basically been here for a minute, been been here and like been working with all the teams and that's really awesome. So just FYI, but yep, yeah, yep. favorite game or fun fact? Uh, my favorite video game probably of all time is maybe Halo 2 back in the day on the original Xbox. Um, and then H1Z1 on PC has probably been my favorite, but most recently, um, I've been loving Valorant. It's my job and I enjoy it. Um, a fun fact. Um, it's not very fun, but I am a a big animal lover. It's a fact. It's not very fun. I, I don't know if I have very fun many fun me. facts. That's fun for all of us. We love animals. So I'm here for it. Um, that's great. Maddie, if you'd like to give yourself a little <clears throat> intro, take it away. Of course. I'm Maddie. Um, I am part of Gen G's Team Bumble. I started off with Fortnite. Um, I've been on Gen G for a little over two years now. Um, I've worked with everyone here, as like everybody else said. Uh, that's about it. That's all I really do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do a lot more, my friend, but that was a good yeah, intro, <laughs> and I appreciate that. Um, do you have a favorite video game, per Sean's, and a fun fact about yourself? Hmm. Favorite video game? Um, I love The Sims. It's like so like out of place of what I usually play, but I love The Sims. And a fun fact, uh, I I played soccer for fourteen. That's very fun. Like, mm -hmm. you mean the the tr the traditional game of football? Like the um, football, yes. The football <laughs> is amazing. Um, just going back really quickly on the sims thing i feel like everyone nowadays is saying like they love the sims but i only have tragic memories of the sims growing up buying the cd-rom and like not having enough money to make more than like a 12 square foot apartment and yeah. like them like constantly going to the bathroom like not in the bathroom so like <laughs> what was i playing a different game was i doing like sam's or something I don't know. The Sam. that's the that's uh, question i need answered immediately uh, i guess you have money management problems but i um oh. i i would usually use like the the mother load cheat to like give myself fifty thousand dollars wow. oh so what you're saying so is... I, I cheated a little bit but you know what i needed oh. the boost god my sims okay. are always broke <laughs> I feel this is another another stream for another time we can go <laughs> on about the logistics of the Sims. Like, why were they not making more money? But we digress. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, thank you guys so much for your intros. Um, a little bit just for anyone who came in, as well as I know we had some mild technical difficulties, but the show went on and here we are back again. You can see our faces. You are so lucky for that. Um, we are here for our first episode of the workshop, which falls under the Genji community umbrella called Work From Home. Um, as you may know, you know, obviously last year, a lot of us had to change um, working from an office or working in traditional settings and working from home. And from there, we kind of realized, you know, of course, you can do anything at home. You can work, you can stream, you can game, you can 
train to be professional. It all can happen in your home. So we wanted to create a community um, where we can sort of help y'all in your journeys towards success, whether it's through professional gaming, whether it's through working in esports and answering all of your questions in regards to career, professional gaming or education and anywhere and everything in between. Um, something awesome about this is this workshop as well is that although yes, it'll be a panel and we're going to answer and ask some amazing questions and we'll be taking some questions from the chat. We will also be doing an interactive portion at the very end where there will be a VOD review um, with Andrew and Nate. They will be um, reviewing a Valorant situation from a match previously. So stay tuned for that at the very end. Plus, did somebody say giveaway? <laughs> that somebody, I said giveaway. <laughs> Yahoo! <laughs> there will be giveaways in the chat. So make sure you are using your literary skills in the chat to make sure that you can enter for some fun giveaways. Other than that, I'm going to just dive right in. We're going to go into um, some questions for y'all. It can be general questions if someone feels so. Um, like wanting to really answer them, just feel free to just jump in. But we'll start with the first normal question, and that is going to be, how did you get into gaming? But we'll use it in the sense, the challenge is going to be that it'll have to be an elevator pitch. So you do not have all day to, to, to tell me this. We do not have a PowerPoint presentation, but you have about like two minutes to tell a stranger how you got into gaming and why you chose the situation. So I'm going to kick it off with Maddie because we love being random and change is fun. So Maddie, go ahead. Um, my family's always had like PlayStations, the Wii and all that stuff, but uh, my older brother was playing a computer game called Common Arms um, when I was about nine and I really liked it. So I got into that and wanted to keep playing. And I fell in love. <laughs> that, was, that was a really fast elevator. You went from like four well, to I got really from, scared. Yeah, you stressed us out. You started having that fast. Okay, I'm sorry. You went from like the lobby floor to like floor three. But just think about it that you're like, we're in like a large, like a very large building. Like we're at like the Empire State Building. So you've got time. You've got a couple of floors. So if you'd like to add anything more as we go up to the penthouse, feel free. And if not, you can kick it on over to someone else. No, I think I kind of said my story, but like, Faster than I thought it was. Well, now that's you know. It. Now you know that you can speed speed um, explain yourself. So that's another thing that you can put on your resume. So awesome, um, Andrew. Yeah. Why don't you go next? And you can take from the lobby to the penthouse if you'd like. Lobby to the penthouse. All right. Mm -hmm. So when I was a small, small child, I remember <laughs> early it was a cold day. <laughs> um. I've always been uh, into video games. I remember like going to and from church when I was young, playing uh, Pokemon on my Game Boy, you know, having to turn on the light in the car, having my dad tell me to turn it off, going back and forth. That was before screens were like illuminated in the background and everything. Um, and then it just, I kind of transitioned into like consoles and stuff like that. Um, in high school, I got out of gaming a little bit, started focusing more on academics and stuff. Gaming wasn't as prominent and uh, seen as necessarily like a career choice. So I focused on that, went through college and everything. Out of college, got a, a job in logistics. I wasn't really enjoying it. I fell in love with H1Z1 again. Uh, I ended up grinding it a ton, and I ended up making it into the H1Z1 uh, Pro League. Um, so Rest I did these. <sighs> R.I.P. Some oh. coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> um so i did that for uh six or seven months in las vegas um when that ended i came back home i was looking at opportunities back uh uh just in the general workforce using my degree and stuff and then uh i, I came across a job opening for uh gen g i sent in an application i had an interview with nate it went pretty well and now now i'm on a, a work from home panel for gen g i love it we love to hear it you have done it you broke into it and that was amazing um and and you got to the penthouse fairly nicely so great job thank you thank you nathaniel would you like to take the penthouse back down to the lobby yeah i'll That's take great. it right back down so uh, i've been gaming my entire life i think uh truthfully my parents divorced when i was like two and they wanted to buy me love and that came in the form of consoles <laughs> mm, and so i had you know game boys and xboxes and playstations and i played them and then when i got into high school there was like a gaming club and i joined that and i played halo and i got pretty decent 
uh, I discovered Major League Gaming, the website, and I started learning that there was like a whole world of professional gaming. Uh, as I went to college, I got into PC gaming and started playing League of Legends and met some of my best friends. And I've just been so interested in watching people like try and live the life I wish I could have lived as a professional gamer, right? I'll never be a professional basketball player or soccer player, but maybe if I was born 10 years later, I could have been a gamer. And so giving back as general manager, signing players is something that I'm passionate about and something that I always want to do. Never say never, my friend. You know, I have faith in you. You can do whatever you want as long as you practice and mm -hmm. try your darndest. I think you can be the next. Um, you got it. You and me and Overcooked, Christina. Absolutely. You heard it here first, everybody. <laughs> That's the end of the stream. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, y'all. But that's great. That's really awesome to hear. Everyone has like such different um, openings into gaming. And of course, it's like been with you throughout your childhood as well as all of our ages are a little bit different. But nevertheless, like the fact that it's all been with you guys all throughout your adolescence and youth and it's kind of trickling in in a different form that is, is really awesome. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, speaking of which BTP dubs, I think, um, Andrew, you were mentioning that you went to like college, um, and then you got a job, like ugh, a job, how rude, um, <laughs> you got a job and then like you ended up here. And I know, um, a, a few of us, like our paths are a little bit different in regards to like going through that traditional educational setting, like for the, the three of you, what was your path? Like if we had to go back to like traditional education, like, was it just like, we all went to like high school, went to college, what, what was that? Or does that even matter to begin with? So I'm just going to start with you, Andrew, because I know you mentioned it first that you went to college. Yeah, uh, so my path was uh, I, I went through high school four years, graduated, and then no time, no like downtime, uh, summer off, and then I, I went to uh, the University of Tennessee in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, go Vols. Um, and then I was there for five years, should have been four, but I, I took a victory lap on the fifth year <laughs> and, uh, I ended up getting a, a bachelor's in uh, finance and logistics. Oh, wow. So he like knows numbers and stuff. He probably had, his sim probably had a lot of money. Yeah, his sim was really <laughs> code, he, like for sure had a lot of money. Got it. Okay. Uh, no, mine would have been like Maddie. I would have been inflating my bank a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> bet. I like that. Maddie, what about you? What was your situation? Oh, um, I mean, it wasn't too long ago. Um, yeah, it was like yesterday. <laughs> it was like yesterday, but I, uh, I was going to go to college for criminal justice. I got in, got accepted to orientation. Two weeks before I was going to move into my dorm, I decided to drop out. Um, something just hit me. Like I, I just didn't have the passion for school. I've always hated it, mm -hmm. but I love criminal justice still, but, um, I decided not to do it and I continued streaming and that's when Genji found me. That's awesome. Like it, it's obviously so different, like criminal justice and like Fortnite all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just like, just real quick, like where did you even get your love for criminal justice? Like for me, I'm like, oh, it's because of like NCIS, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But for you, like, I don't know if that was the same or like you have like, yeah. like real reason. No, I, I love those shows. Like, but my dad was a, he was a, he was a correctional officer. So I always had like, uh like like a, i guess a cop in my house when okay. i was growing up but um he had that like the influence of the crime and then when i was, fell in love with criminal minds and ncis specifically i i just had that obsession with it and i i always took it pretty serious like i i took courses in high school um and i just i just thought that was gonna go for it for it but i did it that's fine um one last question on that you know how like there are like games obviously that are like mystery games and whatnot. Do you think like you ever go towards those games to kind of um, live out that life of maybe being criminal justice or is that never an option? You're just like, I would never play that game ever. Uh, I've played, um, what was the name? It was like LA Noir, I think. Yeah, I've yeah, played some of that. Yeah. It was a cool game. Um, I, I have always tried to find games like that, but like mm -hmm. none of them were like intriguing enough. They weren't like, I don't know, they weren't like, well developed. The ones that at least I found. You're not like the Sherlock Holmes of Among Us. Yeah, no, I actually uh, Among Us drives me crazy. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Yeah, I don't think that really applies. But you know what? Now <laughs> anyone, if there are any game developers listening, there is not a good enough game for Madison. So y'all need to. <laughs> I'm free. You better get to work. This game, get to work. Perfect. Um, what about you, Nathaniel? Yeah, so uh, I had a pretty normal high school in Yuma, Arizona. Went to the Harvard of the Southwest, Arizona State, go Devils. 
uh, met a bunch of other gamers. I was supposed to go to law school because that's kind of what my parents told me I was supposed to do for my entire life. So I got a political science degree. I still have it. I didn't use it a day in my life. Um, and I actually skipped a couple of my classes towards the end there, but I met some great people and some great professors that helped introduce me to a world of gaming, whether it was like as a game developer or trying to work into esports. that was really great and I wouldn't trade. Um, so I think the story that really helped me understand that I was probably done with college after four years and wasn't looking at higher education was I hosted a, a bar craft or like a viewing party for the League of Legends World Championship in 2014. And uh, it was at Buffalo Wild Wings and I stayed up until like, five in the morning after it was done cleaning up and making sure everything was good and then i realized i was supposed to take my lsat the next day at 8 a.m so i like rolled out of bed took the lsat it was not a great experience for me and that was the moment i realized that esports was my my calling my passion in life i love that i also did not know you were poli side of it so that's amazing um and we're here for it could have been a lawyer but yeah i guess we'll never know <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, going back now more a little into the typical day in the life, um, I think for other people, especially like, for example, I've tuned into different panel, panels and podcasts, and I've noticed that um, different orgs run different ways and players or general managers or anyone, anyone in between kind of does a lot of different things depending on the org. So maybe walk us through uh, what a day in the life would be maybe before COVID or even during COVID, like how everything has changed. but. What is the day in the life for you at Gen G? And I'll start with Nate, actually. Yeah, happy to. So I think that how the sausage is made in esports is everyone gets to watch the fun times, which is when teams travel to a tournament, they compete on stage, you get to see what they've been working on, but you have to practice to get there. So a day in my life is basically, what is the team doing? You know, what is blank? What is Andrew running the team through? I watch all of their scrims, which we privately stream and see like who's doing well, who's doing poorly, what are the kind of situations we're practicing? What are the teams we're scrimming? And then outside of that, it's what can I do to give the team and Andrew more resources so that we can win? So for example, we worked with uh, David Dennis, who's a phenomenal sports psychologist who helped our CSGO team uh, and was like giving us the right edge we needed so that we could go and win our first LAN event and not drop anything at MLG Anaheim or sorry, DreamHack Anaheim. It's not called MLG Anaheim for seven years. Um, you know, can we get an assistant coach or what do we need to do at our facilities? Uh, what kind of apartments do we need for the players that I work with our wonderful operations team on? For example, all of our players when they lived in LA had gym memberships that they could go to. Uh, we had like relatively healthy food at first, although Maddie only wanted chicken nuggets. And so I think that always staying on my toes and thinking about, you know, what are ways that I can add resources to the team so that I can help them succeed? I love that. Yes. And um, a little bit about that with the whole chicken nuggets thing that's like the first thing that's the first thing i learned about maddie when i first started working here and i was like this is very random but nevertheless i thought oh, it's <laughs> random it's random <laughs> okay <laughs> but i enjoy it very much so um uh, maddie what about you what is a day in the life as pro player been? um well when i was living in la uh before all of covid happened um we spent a lot of time in the office training together uh we would do some bod reviews here and there um i'm trying to remember it was kind of a long time ago uh yeah it is it's been a while but uh ever since i've been home or living here uh i just kind of stream like six to seven hours a day now playing games a lot of us just wake up eat go outside a little bit uh and then play games that's the, the dream that's yeah. the dream there you go <laughs> can't complain i love it what about you andrew yeah, so um, it's mostly my day to day has been fairly similar between like uh, when, when I was in LA and right now I'm here in Tennessee. But just uh, in LA, I was working out of the office a lot. Uh, here, I'm just working out of out of my room. Uh, not quite as exciting as in a nice office, but it is what it is. It is um, my day pretty much is just Valorant all day, just in different forms. Um, uh, professional gamers kind of skew like later into the evenings and nights so my day normally doesn't start until like the afternoon but i'll, I'll start with some preparing like bod review for the team or, or or if we're not focusing heavy on bod review that day then try to prepare something for um server time where we come up with new strategies and things like that we'll do that for like one to two hours and then we have about six hours worth of scrims that's six maps 
Um, in FPS scrims, you play like a full 24 rounds. So one scrim can last generally around an hour. Uh, we have a little break in between there. And then afterwards, I will click through some VODs, watch what I can. And then generally, it's it's more Valorant after that. It's such a new game that uh, I try to spend a lot of my time just watching all different types of Valorant to see how people play it and how they go about it. Awesome. That's really cool. And I feel like a lot of people who are in the esports realm or even outside of the esports realm probably don't even realize like that's what what it takes to be constantly coaching um, an esports team. So that's really cool that you can kind of break that down for us. Um, and just like going speaking now towards Valorant specifically um, for all three of you, um, just on on any aspect, what interests you? In Valorant, it could be like the actual game, it can be the scene, the community, etc. But what about Valorant specifically interests you, I suppose? And I'll start with Maddie, actually. Me? Um, hey, you've been playing <laughs> six hours of Valorant a day. I'm really yeah, you know what? I, 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 uh, hmm. I love the teamwork. I think that's my my favorite uh, part of it. Is that there's a lot of teamwork involved, um, like combining like abilities. Um, communication is is really cool. It, it's just like everything when everything is like put together, it just sounds like crazy, but it's really satisfying when you win around because of teamwork. Awesome, I feel that. How about yeah, you? I think my favorite part about it is like the individual skill expression and how different different players on the same agent can look. Like sometimes you can watch Valorant with the names turned off and know that like oh that's Hiko Sova or this is the way that Sinatra plays Sova especially like in the early days or, oh, that's Sean on Raze because I know exactly how he plays hookah and it's very frustrating for the other team. And I'm excited for that to evolve and see that, oh, this is how teams play. TSM runs triple duelists and they've been really successful with it or Mixwell is one of the first jets that doesn't op. And I think that as COVID goes away and you know we, we get to a more safer land environment, we're going to see some really cool mixing and melding of the, the worldwide metagame. And that's really, I'm playing because I'm ready for that. I'm ready to see that and I want to understand it when it happens. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, that's actually very awesome and interesting to think about. I don't think I've ever thought of being able to see someone's like signature move or like their signature not move. They don't they don't use X, Y, or Z and being able to say like that's that person, that's that person. So that's pretty awesome to think about. Um, what about you, Andrew? Anything about Valorant that really interested you specifically? Yeah, kind of building on top of what Nate was saying, it's such a new game. So no one really knows what's right and wrong. Like, you can find out a way to play your agent that's different than everyone else is playing their agent, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily wrong. You might just be ahead of the meta, and now everyone's going to be playing the game how you were playing it. So when you, like, expand that to every team with five players all playing different agents and stuff, you get some pretty neat and interesting stuff. No two games of Valorant ever look the same, like right now with it, how new it is, and, and I'm not sure it ever will. If you go from region to region right now, you can see that in North America, uh, North America teams are playing completely different and using completely different agents than they are in Korea. So it, I, I'm pretty excited to see like the first international land where we can kind of see which play style is better or if every play style is viable and just how you play around it. Yeah, so that's really awesome. Yeah, and especially to see it globally is going to be the next step and it's going to be crazy and amazing and cool. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. We have a question from the chat um, that is open to anybody, and I will read it out loud from Ryan Badawala. Did I say that right? If I didn't, I'm so sorry. Um, how has the inability to have land affected the progression of Valorant on a pro level? If it was possible to have land, do you think the progression of the game would be further along? Question mark. And anyone can take that. Yeah, I think I'll start and feel free to add on or tell me I'm a big dummy. But I think that Riot has done a fantastic job of creating tournaments and making sure that they set expectations with the community on, hey, this is a new game. This game is in beta. And now this is the Ignition series. This is only our first step. And now we're going to have a Masters event that everyone can take part in that hasn't slowed anything down. We are not missing lands yet because we never had them. It's a little different story in CSGO where lands are these prestigious events and we have the major and all of a sudden they no longer exist and teams don't know what to do. I think, and then to answer the second half of the question, like, uh, do we think the progression of the game will be further along? Well, absolutely. I think Andrew talked about it in that last answer, which is like, what is the right metagame? Should teams be playing Breach on every map? You know, should we be jet opping? Is NB right with having an Omen op on Ascent? There's, there's like a million questions that could be answered if the best teams were playing the best teams all the time, and we're not going to know until it happens. Yeah, I, I think 
Nate's pretty spot on there. Um, some different like compositions and regionally you could see what's better, but I think within the regions, the game has been like developing really well. There's, we have multiple tournament organizers that consistently have uh, tournaments going on almost like every weekend. And then riots really stepped up. So I, I think regionally the game is really like chugging right along and doing really well. Um, maybe like player development's been a little slowed because like learning to play online versus learning to play in LAN is different. You get nervous. There's fans. You have like other stuff. So players have been slowed down, but I think the actual game is developing like really well so far. I agree. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that question. And just as a reminder, anyone in the chat can ask any of the panelists any questions. Um, so feel free to drop them in there and we will sift through and ask them later on. Um, we will move on to a few more questions. Um, this can be specifically for Nate and Andrew. What do you think is the most difficult part of management or coaching in esports? I feel like, I, again, we had talked about it previously, you know, every different org is so unique in their job titles and what they have to do. So what are your guys' thoughts? What do you think, I don't know, is the most difficult part? And um, we can start with Andrew. Um, uh, from my experience so far, uh, they're in esports, I think management, coaching, uh, it's new and it's growing so fast that there's not always like a right way. And sometimes there's not even like uh, you can go look up how other people have done this, how they've approached their VOD review, or you can look at other games and stuff, but there you don't really know yet who's right and who's wrong. So sometimes it's like difficult. You just have to be really confident in yourself and your teammates and the team you're working with and trust that we've put like the right people in the right places to figure out what is the best process and, and stuff that's kind of like unchartered in eSports right now. Awesome. Nate, anything else? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge, I, I'm going to say it, and I love you guys, but working with players can always be a little <laughs> bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. I think that I have worked a corporate job, you know, where you show up at nine and you respond to emails promptly. And it's just something that doesn't exist in professional esports. And I'm sure it's something that doesn't exist in professional sports. As you look at like these kids that are put into European soccer programs that are professional players at 16 years old, I'm sure they deal with the same things. But uh, just to make sure that everyone can see the the truth behind the curtain, it, it can it can be a little frustrating, and I'm sure I can be a little frustrating for them messaging them early at yeah. 11 a.m. See, I, I'm still too close to the players. Nate is one layer removed, <laughs> so he can say that. After this, I have to hop right back into a call <laughs> with the players. So if I say something like that, I'm going to be hearing about it. So, but he mm -hmm. but he's not entirely wrong either. <laughs> Andrew's like, I love the players so much. They are amazing and brilliant. Exactly, exactly. And Maddie's out here just smiling with like, yeah, question mark <laughs> eyes because she's like, this doesn't apply to me. What do you mean? I'm so comfortable. <laughs> Right. Got it. <laughs> I love that for you. And um, I'm going to actually go into Maddie for you um, because we all know that you started with Fortnite with us for Team Bumble and you've trans transitioned and played a lot of Valorant all the time. What are your thoughts on like the transition? What do you like more about Valorant or what's different and unique that you really just interests you? Um, I, I would say I prefer the genre of first person shooters versus third person. Battle Royale. Um, I feel like I have had more success like uh, as a player. But um, I would also say the maturity of the community. Obviously, like there's toxic people everywhere, but I feel like the the community of Valorant is much more mature. They're my age group. Um, they're cooler. They're funnier, nicer. I've had more fun. You've you've probably enjoyed uh, like less RNG too, right? From like yeah. Fortnite to like uh, FPS. 100 percent more, more things in your control i guess yeah i like that i mean obviously there's bloom in valorant but um right there's a, there's a little more control of like your aim and i like that there's um like i feel like i'm playing the same game every day but also learning new agents here and there but with uh fortnite you know play a completely different new game the next day and i i like the difference between that yeah that's awesome I remember some of the early challenges we had when we were getting into Fortnite and I was learning about it and showing up to that LAN in between Christmas and New Year's and they added the boom box that destroyed all the film. <laughs> 
and it was like best of one. And I'm like, what is this? What is going on here? So I can imagine that even Valorant, but like games that are a little more established, like League of Legends and CSGO, you kind of know what you're getting into. Some of these maps have been played for years and years and years. So mm -hmm. that's nice. Yeah. And I think what you were mentioning too about like the community as a whole, obviously like that is aside from just like the game that's actually being played, that whole um, atmosphere that makes you feel like you're having fun versus like getting attacked or like being in yeah. a toxic situation. That's definitely helpful. So I totally understand where you're coming from in that. That's really cool. Um, I have another question from the chat. I think I'm just going to sprinkle them in here because we love a good sprinkle. It's like a nice Perfect. salt bay situation. Um, Jaya XOX says, how does a person get into coaching? Is there requirements or specifications needed? I will let either Nate or Andrew. I can start and maybe say with like what I look for in a coach and then Andrew can maybe talk about like how we made the transition from player to coach, something like that. Mm -hmm. So what I'm looking for in a coach is someone who really understands and can empathize with the player experience, which is why so often we see players become professionals in esports, uh, become coaches, sorry, players, professional players become coaches in esports mm -hmm. because it's hard to understand as an adult or as someone who hasn't competed at the highest level, some of the stresses that are going on and the amount of information you need to ingest and the amount of practice you need to do, especially when you're like a young professional and you have other things going on in your lives. So it's very helpful for me in that. And once I am comfortable that someone understands the player experience and would be like the right culture fit for Genji, then it's all about like, hey, what are you going to do? I think I've asked every coach's question, like, what does a day look like at Gen G if you were going to do this? And that's when they show me like, okay, well, here's a schedule or here's like, I reviewed this VOD personally and here's the notes I took and this is what I would share with some players. Some examples of exactly what they would do during the day. Uh, and then if everything goes well, they get brought on as a coach. Yeah, I think Nate's like spot on. Um, as far as I think experience, so so playing the game super important, like enjoying the game you're trying to coach is important. And then getting involved in whatever level you can like right now. Um, most esports scenes I I've been involved in, Apex, Fortnite, um, H1, Valorant, they, they all have like a, a central Discord server where scrims are ran out of, where players interact with each other and things like that. So I'd re recommend if you want to get into coaching, get in one of those servers and, and start wherever you can. You, even if it's not a, at a top level team, it's okay to start down. Experience is like the most important thing for, for a player and a coach, in my, my uh, opinion. The more time you spend working on it, uh, getting things wrong, getting things right, you're ultimately just going to be uh, better at it and, and you'll be more prepared. That's great. And I agree. I feel like experience in general, I know it's hard to find. We always see those memes where it's like jobs are looking for 500 years of experience. <laughs> yeah, entry level. Yeah. Entry level. It's totally okay. But I, I agree. I feel like just working hard and grinding constantly is definitely going to be helpful in the long run. So it totally makes sense. Um, another question from the audience, because we love a good sprinkle. Um, Bazball has asked, how can college students best prepare themselves to be employable and successful in the esports industry? Um, obviously, I know Andrew and Nate, you had mentioned like this wasn't necessarily you didn't like go to a major and become this um, and your paths kind of ended up towards going that way. But do you have any advice, um, particularly, particularly in that um, realm? Yeah, I think, and maybe I say this because of my background with a political science degree, that you can work in esports with any degree as long as you can show proficiency in like a standard business environment. So like, are you polite and professional? Are you courteous? Do you respond to emails? Do you understand the basics of like using Excel or PowerPoint? If you can do those things and you have a college degree, I think it's a lot easier to get an entry level job. And that's separate from all the jobs that take like very specific proficiencies. So like every esports org is going to need um, graphic designers and video video editors and things like that separate from like competitive management or the more esports side of the business that I work on. So I would say that no matter what you do in college, the skills are all going to be transferable because esports teams are a business uh, and we need people to, to move the gears and pull the levers. Totally. Yeah, I completely agree. I, and it, same thing is kind of what I said previously, even on college campuses, I, I know a lot of colleges now are starting to have esports programs. And ones that aren't, they're getting ramped up and stuff. I would just recommend like getting involved there. Um, it's another way to get experience, another thing that will look good on like a, a resume and you can just continue to build on what you know. That's awesome. I totally agree. And I feel like, yes, again, this is like definitely towards esports and coaching, but 
overall life lessons are always just going to be, you know, like you, using your skills and applying them elsewhere will get you far in life as long as you, you put your mind to it. Um, I want to go into a few questions. Maybe um, this might be more for Maddie and Nate. I know you guys definitely love to troll. Or not troll, I'm sorry, you like to stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. you know, you do that every day. I was actually going to mention during when you guys play or stream, how do you deal with trolls? Um, do, how does it affect you? Oh, I know the, I, the easiest advice in the world. You got to be quick on the trigger finger. Block them, mute them, get them out of there. Love it. It's very easy, especially as like a new streamer or a new person trying to venture into a new area of content creation to like say like, I need that one viewer or that one commenter. And at least they're watching my stuff. Nope. Get them out of here. Block yeah. them and ban them. It's very easy to see malicious people or people who uh, you don't really want in your community. Your community is a reflection of how you curate it. And I, I have quick on the quick on the ban button. Love it. Ban and block. Let's go. Yes, sir. <laughs> what about you, Maddie? Um, I mean, it depends on the situation. Uh, if I have like, you know, the stupid annoying trolls, usually my mods will just get rid of them. But, um, sometimes when I have a toxic teammate, um, I like to put them on the Maddie Springer show. <laughs> and I love that. And it, it usually goes pretty well, but, um, it's kind of me using a little bit of reverse psychology and making them feel like bad. Um, for the way they were talking. Um, and, it, and it can get pretty hectic, but usually I like to settle it down when a chat gets a little too crazy, but um, that's usually how I handle it. I, I like to be above them by overpowering them. By basically <laughs> showing a mirror and being like, this is you, what are you doing? Yeah, pretty much, pretty Love much. Um, yeah, I'll also say that like in, uh, I play a lot of Valorant even off stream just for fun. And like the things that people say in game, just because no one stops them, I've made it like a very important point to me on stream and off to say like, hey, that's not cool. Like, why, why would you say something like that? Because a lot of times the people have never had someone say that. And then they'll just go, oh, my bad. And like, they just won't say it again. And I'm hoping that I'm changing gaming one mind at a time. They probably are just saying, you know, screw that guy. He sucks. But uh, it, it, you can, a lot of times these people are young and impressionable and they don't actually know that like what they're doing as a troll is hurting people or that the things they're doing are not acceptable just because they've seen other people do them. And so you can try and change their mind. And I think that bringing them on a show like that, Maddie, or like kind of elevating them and showing why you think it's silly is one way to do it. And you can also just have a conversation. Both yeah. are good. That's good. I, I agree. I feel like a lot of people and younger people don't really know the gravity of their words and their actions. So the fact that somebody can tell them straight up is probably helping them in the long run. I'm assuming I'll, I'll let you keep thinking that you're doing amazing. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, the back of their head somewhere. There's like a little, yeah. it's like Nate, like, Hey, um, <laughs> I love to see it. Um, just speaking um, on like streaming and like your personal brand as a whole. Um, we have another question from the audience um, from Ryan, Ryan Bat Batawala again. With most pro players now being successful streamers as well, um, how do you think the idea of personal brands will affect the future of esports? Example, people like Ninja and Timon. And this can be, oh, again, for anyone. This is wild. I, I think this is like really the inflection point for what esports looks like. And we probably should do another work from home panel about like Absolutely. the implications of team sponsorships in esports and how that is going to reflect things that are more similar to the NBA, where the teams don't control a lot of individual player rights. But separately, I think what we've seen even in these early days before everything evolves is a player like Tens, who is a phenomenal Valorant player, just saying, you know what? There's no lands. Maybe I'm not having that much fun competing. I can get 20,000 viewers just streaming Valorant, make a bunch of YouTube videos, make a bunch of money. And I don't have to spend a long time grinding and getting stressed out. So we're going to see more things like that. We're going to see a lot of the value in players as streamers go up. Teams are going to have to make really hard distinctions on if they want a certain player because if their stream is big, especially tier two teams or tier three teams, maybe they won't be able to get the next up and coming player because they can't afford it already. I think there's a lot of implications about streaming and individual like revenue for players. Anything you'd like to add on either Andrew or Maddie? I don't think I have the <laughs> IQ to answer that question. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> uh, I definitely think Nate's most knowledgeable on that. Um, I, I think, I, I don't know how it's going to affect it, but personal brands are clearly going to play like a large part in esports. Uh, they already do it and they're going to, they're going to continue. Sure. Totally. 
I agree with that. I feel like everyone in general, whether you're in esports or just like living your best life, like everyone has a hashtag personal brand now that you all need to be worried about. Everyone is Googleable, so be on your <laughs> best behavior. <laughs> um, I want to go back into kind of um, any like advice or tips that you guys might have. So just starting with um, Nate and Andrew, do you have any tips for anyone that's like looking to get into team management or any coaching positions in esports? And you kind of mentioned it in the very, very beginning, like what you're looking for, but if you had to give a quick tip, um, what would, what would your tips be? Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself about the getting involved, but, um, it, it's the, like, it's the best thing you can do. Um, just make sure you're, you're enjoying it. Make sure you're like taking care of yourself personally and everything like that, but try to get as involved as you can in the community and in the scene you want to be involved in. Cool. And Nate? Yeah, I would also say that like we see you be on your best behavior. There are people who have like come into my stream or, or DM'd me on Twitter, like some some not okay things, and then they'll apply for the position, and I'll see their name and I'll think like, are you kidding me? Uh, so like you know, be polite, be professional, understand that we are all human beings and that we remember you. <laughs> you can't uh, even if you are in a community of younger people and you see other people doing things, try and step up and be the most professional person you can be because that makes it easy. It's why it's so easy to work with Christina and Maddie and Andrew here because I know that we're all working for the same goal and we all want to succeed together. And so you just just be very careful in an always yeah. online world. A hundred percent. And that even carries over from like game to game. You'll notice once you get involved in like competitive games that you'll spend some time in one game and then another and, and you'll see a lot of the same faces. So if if you do wrong by someone or or you get a bad reputation, it's it's gonna follow you from game to game. So make make sure you're doing what you can. Mm -hmm. Just be honest, own up to mistakes. You don't have yeah. to. Everyone is so young in esports that I feel like they all feel a mistake is like the end of the world. And it's it people understand. You know, work with your your managers or people that hired you, your team coaches, and just find a way to work together. We all want to succeed. Absolutely. Like I said, it's the hashtag personal branding for all of us. So <laughs> you have the best behavior. Love it. Um, I have one last question and then we're going to go into the interactive portion of this, which will be the VOD review. And my last question to all three of you is going to be imagine, take a moment, close your eyes and imagine like a 13 year old self, wherever that may be, you know, he or she might just be frolicking in the grass kicking a soccer ball or like hanging out, eating a Lunchable, we don't know. Imagine that 13 year old you and what what would be one piece of advice that you would give to that person? It could be anything in regards to your gaming career and in, in regards to life as a whole, anything in between. Um, take that moment and give us a piece of advice for that 13 year old self. And I'm gonna start with our dear friend, Madison. Huh. Um. Mm. I would just tell myself that you're gonna be all right, you anxious little freak. But uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I would just tell myself to be patient. Things are gonna be much brighter in the future, um, and to keep your eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize. Love to hear it. How about you, Andrew? Um, I, I think for my 13 year old self, I, I would just want to tell myself, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Um, I, I think a lot of times I was always trying, I, I was so afraid of doing something wrong that I didn't gain an experience that I could have. Like, it, it's okay to get things wrong. It's, it's how you live and learn. Love that. How about you, Nate? Yeah, I would say the same thing, but in relation to like working with other people. I had a little bit of, and I still do, social anxiety growing up and like not wanting to, specifically I remember even in college, like not wanting to go to like the video game club. Like, are they going to bully me? Or like, I don't know them, but so I just show up alone. <laughs> Should I bring a friend? Uh, and it's like, that's so crazy because everyone I meet is so nice and supportive in like everything. And so that's my uh, my one piece of advice is like people are generally cool, especially if you're you're nice and open and honest with them. Absolutely. I love that. I hope there's a 13 year old out there that's like, yes, this resonated with me. I will yeah. do all of the things. That doesn't mean DM me because there's <laughs> hundreds of you every day. No, DM me. So many. You, you got to stop. I appreciate it. I see it, but uh, we're good. <laughs> but pause. Okay. We love to see it, except for DMs. Are pretty <laughs> we don't love to see it. Um, okay, so that is going to conclude our portion of just chatting it up. I think we're going to take like a hot second while we set up the VOD reviews. Um, and I don't know, Andrew or Nate, do you want to kind of go over what's going to be happening or what we're going to be looking at? 
Yeah, um, so we have a couple of rounds from um, a match we played a little bit before Christmas. It was called the Nights Before Christmas event. And uh, we made it into the grand finals, and we were playing versus uh, uh, Dignitas. So we're going to be looking over a couple of rounds from uh, the final map. It went to a map three on uh, Vine. Cool, cool, cool. And I think we are ready or we are just taking a moment to transitionize and... like that plug it in someone's telling me i don't know if they're trolling me I'm talking about trolls on the internet <laughs> we love a good troll okay i'll be right back oh carly says it's good see this is what <laughs> happened you never know what's going on here uh, I mean, okay, also, like, while we wait for this really quick, because I think it's, we're transitioning super, super quickly, um, does anyone have any tips on, um, I know we, we had written this before, but any tips for anybody wanting to improve their aim or game awareness in Valorant? Yeah. Um, for aim, uh, one of the best things for, uh, well, new, new players is to check out your sensitivity. Make sure that you don't have, like, a drastically high or low sensitivity. A lot of people pick a sensitivity or they go with what the game recommends. And a lot of times it's not best for them. So you can check out like some streamers, uh, different pro players. You can find most of their settings uh, and copy a lot of that. And then um, for a little more experienced player, crosshair placement is really important. You always want to have your crosshair where you expect the enemy to be. Um, so if they show up on your screen, you're able to shoot them without uh, adjusting. I would also add to that, don't go too far down the other end. Because I've met so many like young kids who buy all the nicest equipment and find out exactly what simpler Zywoo are using and aim train for four hours a day and they're stuck in silver. It's like, you, you got to play the game to get better at the game. It's something that Andrew and I talk about a lot is that most of the time the players we find, uh, specifically like Sean and our Valorant team, is just a kid who, who grinded the shit out of the game, pardon my language, uh, and got really good. So while those things are important, um, don't think that they're going to solve all the issues and you have to play the game to get better. Cool. And on that note, um, Andrew, I think it's all good to go. You are ready to um, start this up. Get away, boys. All righty. Uh, let me unmute it. Maximize it. Andrew right. refused to do a VOD review of my stream, by the way, chat. He wanted to do one of our professional games, which I thought was <laughs> not very cool. Yeah, Nate will have to pay me for that. Um, so this is the first round. Uh, we're starting on attack. It's map three. Um, I believe, uh, Dignitas beat us on Haven. We beat them on Ascent. So it all, it all comes down to this. Um, this is a pistol. Pistols are pretty important in Valorant. Uh, it's the first of 13. So if you win the pistol, a lot of times you win the, the second round. So there's like a lot of strategy and VOD review that goes into pistol rounds alone. Um, when you VOD review, you can kind of be looking like at your own gameplay and uh, your teammates' gameplay to see where you can improve there. Or you can VOD review to see what enemies do, where they have weaknesses, and how you can uh, prepare for them. So we will go through this pistol. Control. You're safe and sound. Early smoke down low. That's going to... So we're, we're being pretty patient here. I actually think Dignitas has a, a fairly interesting setup on their pistol that you don't see a ton. Um, the Sova over here, recon down, be long. So if we don't shoot it or no one shows up on it, then they, they have a little information that maybe we're not towards B. What's interesting about their setup is from the start until at this point, they have two guys that are basically just sitting in spawn. Which so they're not actively involved anywhere, but they're really ready to rotate based on where we show any presence. Come on. EMP. Oh. And Nate, Maddie, anyone's welcome to if they have a question or have something I don't see, uh, please hop in. Absolutely. Of course. That'll hold back rotation and even more so. So they're still just sitting. They haven't now. So at this point, we were throwing a flash out and we smoked, and you can see that they instantly, they're already here to help their teammate. And then there's a lot going on. You see Ray's bot come through, you see flash bangs, you see everything, but we're fully committed. And their last players have now completely rotated over. So we basically have like a, a 5v5. Some of that X Factor 
and they actually wall would them. you say that you think they rotated over that quickly because of that arrow like that arrow at the start of round is probably what's setting up maybe this execute and how quickly they're able to get over here yeah so they're, they're very confident no one shot it and it didn't see anyone so they're pretty confident if they see anything towards a there's a decent chance it's our whole team I also think that our team is a little bit known for like heavy five man executes. So I would say teams are even more likely to rotate faster against us than they do against. Got it. Hard fight, hard fight over towards short. But actually, there's nothing even there. They just want to go for it. Some of the double off the frame. I can see our pro players in the chat talking about pistols and they're getting roasted. So uh, maybe I'm not as confident on this pistol, even though we do have spike down with a uh, man down. Oh. Um, yeah. So we did indeed get the bomb down, but uh, <laughs> the whole team got wiped and they were able to defuse. So something we could go through and look at like individual player POVs if you had them and see if we had individual mistakes. But a lot of times it's like uh, at, at a professional level, it's more of like an overarching theme mistake. So now maybe we've learned that Dignitas on Bind likes to keep people in spawn. So maybe we could abuse that by hitting a site fast. Or if we know that they like to rotate fast, maybe we can we can throw a fake towards A, but really be ready to hit B fast. Got it. I'm going to speed it up to the next round. So on the second round, there's a, a couple different like thought processing from teams. You'll have some teams that want a full save. So then going into round three, they can completely buy weapons and it's a full gun round. Um, in this one, we were ho we went ahead and fully bought in round two, hoping we could catch them off. What would you say is more popular now in like maybe even solo queue and professional medic game? Do you see teams like buying stingers round two or? Um, it's it's probably pretty split, and I think it kind of depends on like if you're on attack or defense mm -hmm. or um. Yeah, I, I think there's some teams that live by it. I've seen it in scrims. There's some teams that will buy every second round. And then there's a lot of teams who don't, but they'll throw in a second round buy every once in a while because they expect they can keep uh, catch a team off guard. I, and then I think like in solo queue and ranked, uh, Maddie probably has a better view on it, but I, I think a lot of people force and ranked on the second round. Yeah, yeah, I would say even if they lose first round, most teams do force now, like no matter what. Yeah, that's what I've seen from what I've watched and ranked as well. So we forced up here. We're doing a similar thing. You can see like two agents trying to get information towards showers. They they smoked here. Uh, you can see it on a player one screen. And he also cameraed in so he could get information. But the way the Rays countered that is by sending his room bot through the smoke. So they're both using their abilities just to gather information. A lot of times in Valorant, you use your abilities not for kills, just just to get information so you can make better. Goes down. Got it. Locked on him so he knows there's at least one person there. Okay. And then it's a waiting game. These guys are playing pretty passive on B, but we don't have anyone towards B. So they do have the opportunity if they were feeling a little more aggressive or something, you can push out here and get information and then they would be rotating over faster. Trying to pressure out a player back in the bathroom. Boom, bot. Flashbang around, create a little space, walling off U-Haul to eliminate an angle for us. And then it uh, then, wow. turns into fights. Yeah, unexpected Dignitas are trying to make their way or uh, Gen G, they're trying to make their way onto site. And again, in Man, Omen Blind is so good. Even at $400 now. It's crazy how much it does for a team. Yeah, I think the Omen Flush is arguably the best defensive utility um, in the game. Uh, it covers so much space. It can shut on bind. It can shut down a whole lane. Uh, and it just, you can't do anything. You have to turn around and hide. Bathroom side of U-Haul. They just want to go straight up for that. But this round also did not go that great for us. Right, so when a round two force fails like that and you don't even get bombed on, I assume round three is just full eco and you have to go up against this. You're kind of losing the... You're giving yourself a chance to break their econ with the stingers, and if it goes wrong, you're just losing an extra round. Is that how that works? Yeah, so on. Uh, if you're forcing up on round two, you're saying we're going to fight the economy game. We want to get ahead on economy. But if you force up and you lose that second round, you just have to say, okay, they're going to win the early economy game. We're going to save or... 
in uh, Valorant, it's pretty easy to know when you can afford a pistol or not because the HUD shows you how much money you're going to have going into the next round. So um, you'll see, like, we have a, a couple pistols here and there, but but we're pretty much saving, and we're just trying to get the round over. Mm-hmm. So then we're going into uh, what would be considered the f- first full gun round. But since we didn't um, kill kill many of them, they still have like SMG stuff. So this is a really important round to win when you're down 3-0. This is where you would want to break out one of your stronger strats, something you're comfortable in, something that has like a, a high win rate. Because you really need to like get a win here to get back into the half. So you can see on this round, we're like, it's an important round and we're much more spread out on this round. We've got everyone watching everything um, to make sure if they're trying to push, a lot of teams get aggressive when they have weaker weapons because if they sit back and take long range duels, they're at a disadvantage. So these guys, we're expecting them to get aggressive with their weaker guns, but we're also watching everything so they can't get into our back. Loaded and well, of course can be dragging forward just a little bit. So for people in the chat who maybe don't play like TAC FPSs, you, you talked about this kind of spread out default and figure it out. Who mm-hmm. makes the call and like how, what information are they using to make the call that, hey, now it's time to go? Um, so yeah, you have a, you, most teams have a, a central in-game leader who kind of starts the round with what the overall strategy for that round is. Sometimes it can just be a, a really fast execute or it can be spread out. But when you spread out, your everybody's job is to gather as much information as they can with their abilities and just what they see on their screen and then feed it back to your IGL. So then your IGL can make a decision based on what's happening. Got it. Going forward, death. You can see here, like just by us cameraing and holding this area, we've managed to keep four of them locked onto a site, but we're, we're not even hitting a site. Speed it up a little more. So by the time we've regrouped to get ready to execute onto B, they still have three here. So we're we're in an advantage here positionally. Mm-hmm. And Psalm's using his Phoenix Salt to come through the teleporter and either get a kill or get valuable information. That that they did pretty well there, like. Uh, they pushed into Hookah at the same time, so they're kind of crunching where they expect us to be. Towards B mid. Oh, what a swing. It draws the attention away. As you can hear, the commentators enjoyed it. <laughs> I enjoyed it less, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> I did not enjoy it at all. <laughs> they they haven't seen any pressure A, so they're rotating another one over. We get our smokes down, and we're committed to fighting for sight here. This is a super common killjoy ult you see uh, in elbow here. Uh, it forces you out of sight, and it's very hard to get in there and actually destroy the ult. These rotations, they're expecting them to rotate out, but we know Gen G. They love to re-exec into lockdown. He is not wrong. We do love <laughs> to freeze and re-hit a site, so that's what's happening here. They'll stick around. Three players still remaining. 30 seconds now, and there's an easy TP that Odorous can take to even assist his teammates even further. Gen G, there's no point in canceling. You're so committed here. You have four players pressed up against this. We're, we're ta- even though, like, the time's going down and it feels like we're running out of time, we're, we're holding because we want them to start second-guessing their D. It's like, are they actually coming B, or maybe we can get this Phoenix guy to start leaning back towards A? So it's a 3v5, 10 seconds, we're wrapping site. We're in a pretty disadvantaged situation here, but you always have players that are extremely talented that can swing things back in favor. And you'll see that. In this same stand, a great swing from GMD. And that's brought them back into this round. Still elbow control remain here for the second. So we got the bomb down. It's a three v three now. So originally our job was to get on site and get the bomb planted, but now that we have it down, we have to prevent them from defusing it. The spike. 
smoke in their face. They still have a player over towards Long. That's going to be Dash. Massive and elbow. Takes down Michael. Last two players are isolated back towards side, but in comes the white swing from DMD. As oh, you can see in the kill feed, yeah, DMD <laughs> pretty much decided that we needed a round, and he was going to get it for us. So this was actually a super, super uh, important round for us. This half could have easily gotten away from us. Yeah, there was a question from the chat while we were watching that when you started talking about IGLs, and that was like, do IGLs play any particular role in the game? And I would say that while a lot of the time they are sentinels or controllers, just because there's a lot of time to sit back and those characters should be alive for the majority of the round, that's definitely not the case. And I think you see it is definitely not the case when you look towards CSGO. You have players like Art who are just pure entries and their job is to go in, get information, maybe get a kill or at least get traded, and then continue to lead their team. Because even though you're dead, you can provide valuable information or play calling to your teammates. Yeah, I think it's pretty variable in this game right now. I'm not sure if IGLs will like start gravitating cer towards a certain role or agent, but right now across like all of the, what what you could say are the top 10 teams, you see IGLs playing all, all sorts of different agents. Yeah, so we're only 4 rounds in and and I think we we've already spent 15 minutes or so on this. So you can see how like bot review is something that you can really get as much out of it as time you put into it. Um, you can sit here and break down rounds and really, really find tendencies of different teams, how how they interact with other teams, where they use their abilities and stuff. You really can never bot review too much. Um, uh, there's always something to be learned. Even you pointed out earlier, and I think it's important, but even the casters VOD review, because the second they saw the Killjoy Ultimate come down, they said, hey, Gen G usually will leave the radius and then re-hit the site. And so it's something that you can not only do, you know, quietly at home trying to figure out teams, but casters and other professionals in the scene, their job is to figure out what the trends of the teams are and what they're going to do in this situation so they can better predict the round. Yeah, no matter how hard a team tries, they, they're always going to have tendencies and things they favor. And if you go into a match knowing what their tendencies and what they favor, th then you're already a little ahead. Totally. That's awesome. Thanks so much for the VOD review. And obviously, after watching that, um, I am now going to be a professional Valorant player. <laughs> hey, so love to You're ready. I'm getting ready. ready. Yeah, Blink, I know you have to go to scrims, so I will see you guys there. No problem. <laughs> I'll be working it in there, so it's no big deal. But on that note, we're going to end this uh, first episode of the workshop. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Um, we're going to go quickly around Robin. Y'all can say your socials. We'll begin with you, Andrew. Where can they find you on Twitter or whatever? Yeah, if you want to find me, if you want to follow me, the best place is on, uh, uh, on Twitter. Uh, it is at T O O blank at two blank. Uh, follow me, hit me with some comments, whatever you like. Uh, and I will, uh, try my best to get back to you. Try my best. But if I get flooded, it may not happen. Awesome. I hear that. <laughs> and Nate, you can go for it. Yeah, I'm Stans on Twitch and YouTube, and I'm Nathan Stans on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, please don't DM me. I will probably not get back to you. If you do have a question for me, you can always join my Discord. I think you can find it on my other socials. That is the most likely chance of me answering. Uh, but that's where I am. And definitely keep tuned. So you probably saw the announcement today. If you're in this stream, you're probably a fan of Gen.G. You know that Kusta has been announced as our fifth. So we have a big tournament coming up in Valorant. We were just looking at Valorant clips. Uh, please show up in the stream. Show some love. Be a Gen.G fan. That's very important to me. You heard it there first. And Maddie, what about you? Um, my Twitter is just Maddie Sun, M A D D I E S U U N. And if you need to get in touch with me, just message Nate. He's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll handle it right away for you. Perfect. Love to hear it. Okay. Thank you again so much. Congratulations to all who have won the giveaways in the chat. Um, we'll reach out to you in regards to getting your, your swag. Um, thank you so much again for tuning into the first episode and there will be plenty of more to come and we're so excited to be sharing them all with you. Bye. Thank you, Christina. Of course. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.